Thank you very much for coming. Um, two other thanks before I sort of get stuck into the talk. Firstly, sadly they're not here, but I'd like to thank our conservators and photographers at the Science Museum who've done a marvellous job to provide you with um, this set of slides. Otherwise, I think the talk wouldn't have been anything like as um, enjoyable, I hope. Um, and the other person I'd like to thank is Bill Brock, who is Crook's biographer, um, who produced a book about two years ago, which has been an invaluable resource. Um, I haven't spent the 12 years that Bill Brock spent on Crooks, um, more like 12 weeks, but I have enjoyed that 12 weeks, and I hope that you'll get something out of this. Uh, coming from the Science Museum, um, I'm particularly focusing on the material legacy, basically the stuff. I'm um, showing you some things that we have and then making some general comments about how the material legacy of science and the ideas of science um, work together, sort of enmeshed, um, to move the subject onwards and to explore more of the world around us. Um, radiometers as buttonholes, you can see the image there. I think that's one of the most magnificent little objects that we have. Um, certainly relating to crooks, it's one of my favourites. Um, it's about that long and it fits in a buttonhole and it just shows how crooks use his instruments not just as um, manifesting the um, phenomena that he was looking for, not just for measurement, but also as in a playful sort of way and in a way that promoted himself, which he had to do the whole of his life. Um, you've heard a bit about me. You'll hear William Crooks coming up very soon. Talked about material legacy. Um, you'll also notice this slide is rather green. It's green for a purpose. Um, I said to a colleague at the museum, do you think it's, this is a bit much to make the slide green? but why not? It's got to be some colour. This is nearly the green of the thallium line, the closest I could find. Um, and as many of you will know, I know some people in the audience know a lot about Crookes. Um, he was the discoverer of thallium in 1861, and he did it by spectroscopic methods. Right, the structure of the talk. Brief biography first of um, William Crookes. Um, the wider context of the science, that he, the scientific environment that he was in, um, during his long life, long and productive life. Then looking in more detail at the material legacy, um, largely from the Science Museum, but also using the Royal Society collections and the radiometers that you can see at the back there. And then some concluding remarks. Right, William Crookes. Um, first of all, the image. This is a golden wedding um, anniversary photo photography, um, set of photographs, 1856. He'd actually already started his active career by then, and 1906 was by no means the end of his active career. He literally did work till he dropped. Um, he, as you can see, a very long life, spanning an incredibly interesting period, I think so anyway, of um, physics and chemistry, because he worked sort of between the two to some extent. He was influenced in his early years at the Royal College of Chemistry by Wilhelm Hoffmann, I think that's how you call him, um, and he always acknowledged wonderful influence of bringing the German techniques from the chemical laboratories over to England. Um, he was there from 1848 until about 1854, I think. As I've already mentioned, he discovered thallium in 1861. That brought him fame. He was an active scientific publisher. He did so much, it's extraordinary. But then when you realise that he got up at 7 in the morning and went to bed at midnight and never really stopped during that time, um, I suppose you can account for that. But he actually edited Chemical News from, I think it was 1859 until he was really quite old, and also the Quarterly Journal of Science and some other bits and pieces along the way. He became interested in spiritualism in 1870. That's um, probably the most contentious part of his career. He advanced vacuum techniques to an extraordinary extent. Um, I think it's safe to say that without, without his techniques, um, science would not probably have taken off in the way it did around the turn of the 19th, 20th centuries. Um, part of that vacuum technique was manifest in the beautiful radiometers. He went on to study cathode rays like a lot of people did. Um, I'll talk about cathode rays and what they are, were, what they were thought to be later. He constantly supported himself through applied science. He was interested, he had mining interests, he had a lot of electrical patents. Um, and at the end of his life, not really, I suppose, at the very end, but in his 70s, became interested in radioactivity and X-rays, like a lot of other people did. And actually, his last project was um, to do with 
glasses, op optical, not optical, sorry, optometric glasses, in fact, sunglasses. He was president of the Royal Society from 1913 till 1916. The wider context, first of all, the organisation of science. I think it's important to, to know something about this to understand um, the place of crooks in all this. He began his active life when, shortly after the London um, universities were set up, very important to him, particularly people like Wheatstone at King's College, um, who helped him in his early career. Um, science was becoming professionalised just when he was starting out, although you could still be the lone scientific worker, which he was, and he never did have a university post. Um, we just take for granted that there's a place like the Royal Society where we can all sit here and um, a sort of conglomeration of scientists, um, the main central institution for promulgating science and supporting it, which obviously was there then just as it is now with very similar sort of role. Um, we take for granted the scientific publications, particularly... Um, the proceedings of the Royal Society and the phil philosophical transactions. Um, interestingly, Crookes was very much part of a new type of scientific publishing, which wasn't for the established elite of science, they're still very small in number, but for um, an increasing circle of people, particularly around photography, which was a sort of scientific discipline, but not actually um, science itself. But, but obviously there were a whole lot of people learning about particularly the chemistry of photography and learning it through crooks with his chemical news and his photographic news. It's fortunate, and we all take for granted, a national repository, that's, I'm talking about the Science Museum and its predecessor, um, where crooks' stuff has largely ended up, um, so that we have the luxury now of being able to look back and studying it. Um, influential ideas, I just wanted to say that the lifetime of crooks um, corresponded with photography being something which I hadn't, I hadn't thought about for a long time until I did this paper because I, it's been quite a long time since I've been particularly um, involved in optics and that sort of thing. But it was an extraordinary stimulus to all sorts of scientific activity at the beginning of his career. Also at the beginning of his career were the energy laws developing. Then we have Darwin, we have the electromagnetic spectrum being discovered. A lot of stages in the really active ferment of ideas. And then, of course, at the very end of the century, the, the big discoveries that are so well known, um, but had sort of been rumbling along for quite a long time, actually, when we look a bit more carefully at this, um, radioactivity x-rays. And I won't say the disco discovery of the electron, because the electron had rumbled along for so long. Um, that came in the last few years. What also we need, these are all the things that I feel that we take for granted and that we need. We need a scientist with a sense of self-worth. Um, and Crookes was that person. I don't like to say he had too much of a sense of self-worth, although he did, he did get into quite a lot of scrapes. But he recorded everything so meticulously, which for us now is, is wonderful. Um, I'm sure most of us don't do that, and we, we don't think that we're sufficiently important. Crookes was quite... He had to establish himself. He had to fight all his life, really, for um, reputation, which he did come to him. But it's very fortunate for us that he was a person who knew that what he was doing was worthwhile, or certainly thought it was, um, and therefore we have a very good record of what he did. The material legacy, these are taken from Bill Brock's book, um, these two images, which are from his Notting Hill home in 1888. He moved there in 1880 when he was just becoming wealthier as a beautiful house. I've been around it. Um, he had his chemical laboratory on the first floor. Well, he had both of them on the first floor. His physics laboratory is this one here. His physics laboratory, I think, is probably the more interesting from our point of view. You can see all the wires, sort of health and safety disaster. <laughs> um, but on the back wall there, there's something quite interesting, which is um, a sort of two-dimensional periodic table of the elements, the, the, the thing that does that. Um, and I'll be talking more about that later, um, 1888 being uh, quite a significant date for the periodic table. Um, I've divided his material legacy up into photography and spectroscopy. Photography was his first love. Um, vacuums and light bulbs, vacuum vessels, that is, um, elements in the periodic table, x-rays and radioactivity, and glass and spectacles. And then at the end, they're mascots and toys, because I think, as I've already said, um, 
scientific instruments are, have different roles, and certainly Crookes used his scientific instruments in many different ways. Right, photography and spectroscopy. See Crookes there on the left as a young man in the 1850s. Um, obviously, that portrait says, I'm a photographer. He sits there with a camera and with his chemicals, his photographic chemicals. Um, this is from a family album, which unfortunately we weren't able to um, purchase. We did purchase some new Crookes, well, I say new, new from our point of view and previously unknown Crookes material in 2009 from a sale um, the family were looking to dispose of sort of the remains of the Crookes material that they had in their own hands. Not a vast amount, but we were lucky to get some of that. And that, even if you're a Crookes um, specialist, you, you won't be familiar with some of this stuff. But that's from the um, family album, um, Crookes, as a young man saying, I'm a photographer. And when you see this nitre specimen here, you can also see at the bottom, William Crookes, photographer. Um, these two images here, the one at the top and the one nitre, are from a very early set of experiments by Crookes. Um, he published in 1853. He was still at the Royal College of Chemistry, and what he was doing was looking at, um, well, in that case, nitre, but quite a lot of them are calcite, through polarising prisms, um, tourmaline prisms that Wheatstone had lent him. Um, it's a, quite a complex thing that he was trying to do. What he found was that Viewed with the eyes, you could see eight or nine rings, but viewed through, um, sorry, viewed through on a, photo on a photographic plate, sorry, not viewed through, on the photographic plate, you see more than you do um, through the naked eye um, because it's picking up wavelengths outside human vision and reacting to those wavelengths, and particularly the ultraviolet. Um, but that's not what Crookes wanted as a photographer. What he wanted as, for a photographer was not this sensitivity to ultraviolet. That's no good to you. You want to imitate the human eye. The camera needs to imitate the human eye to make photography um, rea real, if you like. Um, and he spent a lot of time trying to get his grey scale, because it was obviously black and white photography, um, to imitate reality. And he actually used a bunch of flowers to do this with. Um, to get the yellows and the reds and everything. Not yellow and red on the film, but the right shade of black and white. So it, it looked, from the black and white image, looked um, real, looked natural. Um, so he interspersed um, coloured filters, and I'm afraid I can't remember what the chemicals were, the filters, to um, get rid of these ultraviolet effects that the eye couldn't see so that the camera would be more closely imitating the eye. Um, so that was his first series of experiments which got published. Just at the top there, um, that's the spectroscope from the collection, not particularly related to Crookes, but just to remind everybody, he was also interested in, in stereo, stereo photography, which had become very popular. Um, Wheatstone, again, I've already mentioned Charles Wheatstone at King's College, had invented a method of seeing stereographically um, from using two images, but it was a rather large and cumbersome machine. Um, the one from David Brewster invented the stereoscope of 1851, about 1850-51, um, which became a sort of box form and very convenient for domestic use. And at the Great Exhibition, it took off and um, stereo photography became the rage, and Crookes was also involved in that. The last image on this um, slide is rather a strange one of Nobili's plates, um, as in Leopold Nobili, an Italian um, scientist who published in, 18, in the 1820s. Now, I don't know, we don't know very much about this, and this is just to show that we come from the Science Museum, we have vast collections, but we don't know very much about some things. This comes from the Wellcome Collection, which if you're a curator at the Science Museum knows that is bad news because the Wellcome Collections are vast and so little is known about them. Um, we know that this is from Crookes. He called it a metallochrome. We know it's um, deposited lead oxide on um, a steel base. We know that he did it um, by points of um, charge, point, um, electricity on, on his lead oxide. But I don't... I don't really know when. It doesn't seem to have ever been written up. I might be wrong about that. Maybe somebody here can, can help. But um, at the moment, I don't know. We don't know very much about that item. So there's plenty more to do. Just two more images of the beautiful 
um, calcite through the tourmaline um, lenses of Wheatstone. Tourmaline plates, they weren't lenses, sorry. Right, spectroscopy. Now, spectroscopy has a long and interesting history before the well-known experiments of Robert Bunsen and Gustav Kircher, uh, which were published in 1860. People tend to think of this was the beginning of spectroscopy. It was certainly a massive step in the history of spectroscopy, but it wasn't by any means the beginning of. And it's a shame that um, interesting work that was done in the early 19th century tends to get sort of pushed under the carpet. Um, I'm presuming that the audience here knows how spectroscopy works, although I will just quickly say that um, you split up any light, whether it's electric arc light, which was of great interest at the time, of course, whether it's a flame, whether it's the sun, or any other type of light, phosphorescence, fluorescence, um, you put it through a prism, as it was, or a, tra a train of prisms. You could do it with um, diffraction gratings, but that wasn't done until later. Um, and you split it up into its constituent colours, which then you can um, record, and each element is now known to have its own um, signature, if you like. But that was all nice and tidy, tidied up, if you like, by Bunch and, and, and Kirchhoff to some extent, but there was an awful lot of work that went on before that, particularly with those people interested in photography like William Fox Talbot. And in fact, the first lines were seen in 1802 by Wollaston, William Hyde Wollaston, and he was looking for um, the breaks in the colour of the spectrum. Um, I'm sure we all know Newton said there were seven colours, therefore there are seven colours in the spectrum. There had to be seven colours because of the musical scale, of course. So, <laughs> but um, when Wollaston saw, saw his black lines, um, the D line is still um, a hangover from Wollaston's day, the very earliest sets of lines, when we call it the sodium D line, he thought the black lines were demarcating the colours, and um, that was really how the thinking went at the time. Um, Joseph Fraunhoff for then saw loads of um, lines in the solar spectrum, but he was really interested in the glass primarily that he was using and the qualities of the glass. Um, it, was, it was suspected, certainly by the 1820s, um, that each element had its own spectrum, but there were so many problems with it. Um, it's quite a complex business, as everything seems to be. You have absorption spectrum and you have emission spectrum, so you, sometimes you have the black lines which aren't there, sometimes you have the coloured lines that are. Um, one major problem with spectroscopy in this period was the fact that sodium seems to get everywhere and everything seemed to have these yellow lines in. Um, have we got sodium there? Yes, we have. There it is at the bottom there, sodium. Um, and so these people were led to believe that there was a sort of background um, element that some lines were always there um, which was a problem with contaminants because you don't need very many contaminants now I'm mentioning spectroscopy here because Crookes had been had done quite a lot of spectroscopy in the 1850s and I think this is where he fell down slightly because of his lack of theory um, that's going to be a sort of topic at the end to what extent do you need theory and to what extent do you need experiment Crookes was always heavy on the experiment, light on the, on the theory. Um, but Crookes, Crookes had done a lot of spectroscopy, and it's interesting that in 1861, um, Hoffman, who I've already mentioned, did a, a lecture on spectroscopy at the South Kensington's Museums, which is the predecessor of the Science Museum, and he had to borrow Crookes's spectroscope because it was the best one around. Now, unfortunately, we don't have that spectroscope, although we do have a later one. These are some of um, Crookes's and one not Crookes <laughs> um, things in the collection. The bottom one here is the remains of his spectrum camera, rather sad, and it nearly got thrown away. I'm very glad it didn't quite manage to get out of the door. <laughs> um, we have these complicated processes for getting rid of things, and then they tend to sit around, and if you're lucky enough that it's still sitting around 50 years later when it was supposed to have been disposed, um, often these things come back <laughs> and have a second life, if you like. This is the remains of his spectrum camera. Um, I've put up there an image of the Q photoheliostat, um, sorry, Q photoheliograph, because I think it's a, essentially a similar instrument. It's a camera stuck on the end of a telescope, which was actually used to view solar eclipses and also um, the sun's corona, this sort of thing. In about the same time, 1858, 
1860. The spectrum camera would have been pretty similar to that, but stuck on the end of a spectroscope. The other little item there is um, devised by Crookes and written up um, 1859, in fact, it's a direct vision, vision spectroscope, which means that the prisms don't sort of turn corners but go, go straight onto each other, so you get a straight line. Um, in one of those tubes, uh, you get a slit and a stage in another one, and then the um, objective in the third. And that was an attachment for a microscope, so that you could use a microscope like a spectroscope. Now... Now we come on to thallium. I can't believe that the spectrum of thallium is that simple, but when I Googled it and found one, that's what it gave. At least um, it's certainly very green. Um, 1861, this was immediately after Bunsen and Kirchhoff's paper, was um, an explosive time for the um, discovery of elements and by spectroscopy, and they are all named after the colour of their lines, which I think is a lovely idea and makes them easy to remember as well. So it's cesium for sunlight, rubidium, um, red, beautiful ruby, indium for indigo, and thallium for green twig, which was Crookes's um, contribution. Now, Crookes deserved to find an element, I think. He'd been so long, he's so painstaking. Um, and the element he found is thallium, which is in that metal, con that, the metal in that container. That is not our thallium in the museum. Our thallium in the museum is in a broken tube and looks awful, <laughs> because thallium um, corrodes very, very quickly. It's what is always described as a poor metal. It's really not good for anything, and it's very poisonous. Um, there was a controversy over the discovery of thallium, as I know somebody in this room knows a lot about, um, which raises interesting questions as to what constitutes discovery of an element. Do you have to discover the line, which Crook had, Crooks had done? Do you have to isolate the element, which... Lamy had done, and you can see that, strangely, in that um, photograph, which is an older, old photograph, not one I had done, um, it's Lamy's book um, with Crookes's um, specimens on top of it. Now, Lamy exhibited um, in 1862 in the International Exhibition here in London, and he actually had produced thallium, which was a problem for Crookes, Crookes because Crookes had discovered a line, um, and then... Another thing you were supposed to do, which you really should do, is discover its atomic weight because there are these sort of components into identification. This is Crookes' laboratory notebook where he first mentions thallium in March um, 1861 and some, obviously, quite a lot of thallium samples to go with that. Um, anyway, Crookes, particularly in England, did get the credit, Lamy similarly, and most people nowadays credit both people with the discovery. Um, let me just, and here's some more samples, 25 samples. This is um, one of our old photographs, as, as you'll see. Um, obviously, there's lots of problems these days with health and safety and getting into the chemicals, um, which are stored at our store in um, Olympia. Some more spectroscopic items. Um, spectroscopy very quickly became established. Spectroscopes became widespread almost immediately. Crookes patented this little one down here in 1861. Um, you can probably just see Crookes' spectroscope engraved on it. Um, I always think it's rather strange that these are obviously for people who were just sort of walking around. This is a sort of pocket-sized instrument. Um, I suppose there's no harm in just going out and looking at the spectra of anything you happen to come across, but it does seem strange because it's not a laboratory instrument by, by any means. And another type of um, spectroscope which is very popular was the rain band, so-called rain band spectroscope, which are little direct things, even smaller than this. And you were supposed to look at the sunshine, and if you saw particular bands, it was supposed to be going to rain. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that's uh, it was an accurate um, I, I, prediction. I really don't know. But I, I am surprised, and I think maybe it needs looking into, as how many of these sort of amateur-type instruments were were made. Um, it's not normally in a laboratory that you would simply look at a spectra. You'd have to compare um, something known. Had you discovered something new, or was it known, or was it this thing that you already knew? And very um, soon, you got standard sets of colours um, in the image above there, 
That's by Browning, Browning and Ladd, the two instrument makers who made nearly all the spectroscopes that, that seem to be, certainly in, in our collection. Um, so that people, that one is a standard sample, so you, you can measure what you've got against um, the standards. That um, spectroscope up there was designed by Crookes to compare two samples again. Um, actually, the eye, the eye piece is sort of the top end of that, which is it's rather strangely set up. And again, it's got internal prisms, and you can see two spectra side by side. Now, I mentioned um, atomic weights. Crookes had to, eventually, it took him quite a long time, measure the atomic weight of thallium, which he did. And this is from Brock's book, I'm afraid, because we don't have his vacuum balance. Um, in, incredibly, what's the word for it, um, accurate weighings that he had to do. He realised that um, weighing at atmospheric pressure is, it gives you very different results to weighing in a vacuum. So what he did was weigh twice at two different pressures so that he could extrapolate back to the weight um, at no pressure. Um, I just put that slide up there because it shows you inside a vacuum balance of the same period. That's also 1870. Um, that's something I, I didn't really have time to ask, though. Would vacuum balances... I think they were normally gunmetal... Um, I don't think they would normally have a glass front, and I wonder if that was specially made for the museum so that people could look inside. But you could see that it, it is indeed a vacuum balance. Um, and then these two thermometers here, the set of seven thermometers that Crookes had, obviously um, there were many instances when he was measuring temperature very accurately. Uh, one of these thermometers, I think, unfortunately, it's the very poor image, which I uh, included it anyway because it was such an important thermometer, goes up to 740 degrees. It's got nitrogen in the tube and it's made of quartz. So this is just to show you really just how precise Crookes was. Now, he found something before I go on, I must remember. He found something strange in his vacuum balance that he couldn't account for because it was a vacuum. He found that hot bodies appeared to weigh less than cold bodies, well, that seems that it might be accounted for by convection currents going up, but that can't be the case in the vacuum, so this is something he wanted to look into. It wasn't the only reason why Crookes wanted to look into this. Um, I imagine most people will know that Crookes was a spiritualist, and this got him into a lot of hot water, especially with the Royal Society, but he wasn't the only one. Um, there were quite a few other scientists interested at the time. It's a very interesting question. Somebody like Richard Noakes has looked into it in, in particular. Um, how much, what can I say? The, historically, looking back, it's difficult for us to put ourselves into their situation for a start. They just had telegraph and the telephone, which could be looked upon as messages from whenever wherever or whenever. Um, the, the sort of the seances in the dark Victorian parlours um, the, with the gaslight obviously sort of gives the, the setting, the domestic setting. Uh, but you've also got um, a sort of open-mindedness, if you like, that science hasn't got, got us everywhere. It hasn't got us everything. And Crookes, for a long time, um, investigated spiritualism in a very scientific way. I think, in fact... He couldn't be scientific, and I think Bill Brock and I would entirely agree about that because of the, the um, social mores of the day, if you like. You would never search a gentleman, for example. Um, we, we were, when we were working on uh, previous projects, looking at Galton. Galton couldn't measure ladies' heads because you couldn't ask them to take their hats off, this sort of thing. Um, the, the social setup gets in the way sometimes, and it certainly got in the way for crooks, but I'm afraid crooks went further than that, and he was totally hoodwinked by these women, and I will certainly stand by that if, if people say otherwise. It, it is rather sad that somebody, who I think Crooks was a very genuine person in a lot of ways, and these people were just making complete fools of him, which was a real shame. Now, this is a magnificent portrait of his medium, um, Florence Cook, um, supposedly aged 14, who knows, um, in 1870, this is, a, this is an image we managed to buy off the owners of the house. Um, very, very kindly um, gave, well, sold them to the Science Museum, um, which we're very grateful for because it's not easy to come by. And with it was a lock of hair of the, um, 
the spirit, who was called Katie King. Um, now, I don't think this is even human hair. It might be a bit cruel to, to uh, test it, but I think the idea was that the spirit manifestation had different coloured hair to the, the girl, who obviously has dark hair. So, Crookes was really interested in um, if there was any physical reality for what he called psychic force and whether it could be measured um, and whether it was different to heat. And he did have to admit by the, by the 1870s, I think it was 74, that he could not find any evidence for psychic force other than heat. But it did move him on into um, vacuum vessels and we talked about his vacuum... Um, where his vacuum balance. Inside his vacuum balance, he used a little tube to light it up, which wouldn't cause too much heat. And that was his first real foray into the very active um, department of science, which um, was, well, particularly electricity in a vacuum, but obviously radiometers don't normally have electrical connections, so we'll just look at the vacuum vessels first. Um, just to remind people that vacuum physics have been going on for a long time, you might be aware of Joseph um, Wright's, Joseph Wright of Derby's beautiful painting of um, the natural philosopher um, with the bird in the bell jar in the 18th century. Um, natural philosophers would usually nearly kill animals and then bring them back to life, which wasn't particularly lovely, um, or experiment um, with lung glasses or, or the whole range of equipment that we have in the George III collection. And this, in fact, is George III's air pump. The air pump was a centrepiece of scientific activities and had been for a long time. But pertinent to Crookes, Crook, sorry, is the radiometers, a large number of which you can see in the back in the case over there. Um, they belong to the Royal Society. We've also got a collection in the Science Museum, and for a while the two were together. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be able to relate the Royal Society radiometers to the actual experiments um, a couple of years ago, as Felicity mentioned. Um, but there are quite a few other radiometers which haven't had that detailed treatment, and it would be great, I think, in the end, for the detailed treatment to extend to the whole of Crookes's um, material legacy. Anyway, these are the Royal Society collection of radiometers. And very lovely they are too, and the conservators did a beautiful job on them, as did the photographers. Now, radiometers look lovely. What you don't see is behind the scenes and the getting down to these extraordinary vacuums that were necessary. Um, Crooks was fortunate in that Geisler, who is coming up, Henry Geisler, who will come up very soon, um, had invented a pump for reducing um, pressure massively more than had been available, say, to Faraday a couple of decades earlier um, by use of mercury dripping. And um, Sprengel, I'm afraid I can't remember his first name, took this a step further. It was incredibly simple, really. You just drop the mercury down a T-junction and it drags the air down with it. It's just that it's incredibly slow. And it was, it was really a problem for Crooks and his assistants. I haven't mentioned his assistants. I, I will in a minute. Um, that everything was taking so long because obviously in race for publication you can't, you can't be that long. And this is a pump that um, his assistant Gimmingham made, Charles Gimmingham, um, which sadly is radioactive, uh, hence it didn't come out of its plastic bag. And this is um, one of our conservators who was very helpful. Um, but fortunately, in days when we weren't so careful, uh, a diagram was made of the pump, which you can see there on the right. And in the middle, it's a slightly later Turpler pump, but it's on the same principles, and they all tend to look rather similar. I touched on Crooks' assistants. Um, there was Thomas Gimmingham for quite a long time, and then um, Gardiner, James Gardiner. They both seem to be excellent assistants, and I can't help feeling that Crooks treated them really quite well. They seem to be extremely loyal and, and very capable. Also, his daughter, um, another, another unsung hero, um, helped with, with his measurements and was quite good at um, fractioning which is, um, of his chemicals. Um, he sort of re she is referred to as unmarried daughter. She did marry in the end, but she lived in the house at Notting Hill for quite a long time and, and did some of his background work. So this is, these are the pumps that we mustn't take for granted. Right, so this is the beginning of radiometers. Um, Crookes would not obviously admit openly 
to the Royal Society, or it was difficult for him at the time, that this interest in the vacuum balance and the hot um, things weighing less than the cold things um, was all he thought bound up, could be bound up with psychic force. And he started a series of experiments in a very long series of papers to philosophical transactions, um, where he had initially hanging in these um, tubes, horizontal tubes, um, pith, pith rods with little pith balls at the end and often straw. He used a lot of organic materials. Um, and the, the, the force initially was sort of up or down. Uh, he would move a hot object or a cold object near to see what would happen. And then gradually, gradually, he um, modified his technique. Um, he made the torsion um, horizontal. This is following on from people like Cavendish in particular, that he, who he mentioned that he was um, imitating earlier experiments. Um, people like Kelvin had used torsion balances quite not very recent, quite recently for him. So you have um, in the middle one there um, the horizontal torsion uh, torque, and then because obviously the glass was getting in the way, as you can see in that tube, um, a bulb which is much freer to move um, is the next step. We're very lucky in having all these steps. And the blackening and the um, not blackening, if you like, of, of um, the piece of test material. And with this one on the right, he managed to get um, a torsion as a sort of spun round and round, but then it would tie itself up with, with string, which is obviously not a good thing. And so Crookes took the, the step, which we now recognise as being the radiometer, and he did that, and he showed it to the Royal Society in April 1875. We know very exactly when he discovered the radiometer, if you like, didn't, invented the radiometer, I should say, um, between the end of March and the end of April, because he submitted the paper without the radiometer, and then in the, the next draft there is the radiometer. And it did create quite a, a storm. Um, we, we, know, we know now about it. This is the first radiometer, so it's claimed, I'm sure it's very, very close to the first one, um, with the pith veins um, and the straw um, so that's quite a... This is in the Science Museum collection. It's quite a magnificent object. Then he went on to do more and more and more, and some of these you can see at the back here. Um, he wanted to know, obviously, what was making it move, um, and that was a very, very difficult question which taxed all the leading minds of the time. Um, a lot of Crookes' questions are quite practical and quite easily accessible, if you like, uh, some of them aren't. I'm not going to go into the very deep ones here because, to be honest, it, you just have to sit down and think about it. Um, but one of the, if you like, easy questions was, what's the maximum number, what's the optimum number of veins? And he tried with all sorts of things, and he rather liked six. I think that one there is six. It's one of his early ones. Um, the middle one there is an interesting one. It has actually ten veins, but two of them are taken up with a magnet um, which came from a watch spring. And he had the magnet outside the um, bulb, and he found that um, magnetic effect would work through the vacuum. Obviously, he was looking at what affected the radiometer. Heat and light were obvious ones, and he experimented with so many different heat sources and light sources, even different types of, of candle. The beautiful one there on the right would have been even more beautiful, sadly. It's one of the ones at the back there. Um, Originally, it would have been red and green, and fortunately the red of the um, selenium has faded to black, but it's still got the chromic oxide green on it. He wanted to know what sort of salts would, um, would be more or less affected. He experimented with the shape of the veins. Um, they weren't always what we're used to now, sort of little flag-like things. They were cones or hemispheres, or in this case, um, hemicylinders. Um, and he... he um, not just different shapes, but different materials. These ones are aluminium, or were they shiny, were they not shiny, all this sort of thing. And the beautiful one on the right there is a spiral radiometer. I realise um, it's already quarter to two, heavens. Spiral radiometer, I'll have to go a bit faster, which always, always um, face the source. Right, pre-Geisler and Geisler tubes. There's Geisler, and there are some older tubes, the Aurora tube um, at the top, and a tube that Faraday would have used um, a, a tube of the sort that Faraday would have used. This was a standard geyser tube, the beautiful streamers of light that you get at about a tenth of atmospheric pressure. And they became all the rage 
This is a textbook from 1858, and Geisler's fanciest tube that we have in the museum from the 1876 exhibition. Um, then Crookes became interested, like most of the people, in putting electricity into his vacuum tubes, and there's some earlier types of electrical machine, and there's the Rumkorf coil, which was very important. Um, Crookes used a Rumkorf coil just like this one made by Apps, which gave a 15-inch spark, so it's basically bigger. Cathode ray tubes. Now, Crookes is well known now for his Crookes dark space, um, which you get at colossally low vacuums, really, compared to what Faraday saw. Um, he's down to a hundred thousandth of um, atmosphere. And when you get to the Crookes space filling the whole tube, you then get cathode rays proper, not the pretty things that Geisler had. Um, as you can see, some of these are very reminiscent of his earlier radiometers. And there's the Maltese cross tube. Now, Bill Brock seems to think the, the Maltese cross um, was because of Crookes. He had this uh, motto, Ubi Crookes, Ubi Lux. Um, and that's how the Maltese cross became the standard image for cathode ray tubes. I'm not sure. I thought they might have come a bit before that, but he, he may be right. Cathode rays don't turn corners. This V-shaped tube, you send it down one, and it doesn't reflect up the other one. Um, a geyser tube would have done. Um, you can't bend them except under a magnetic field. The one on the left is a magnetic field tube. Um, you can bend them with a the magnetic field, as I've said. Um, you can see how they're bending on a screen like that. The tube in the middle is rubies. Um, Crookes became very interested in fluorescence and, in fact, wasted a lot of time on it because it's not a, it's not a good way of um, forming spectra because impurities have such a bad effect on them. The tube on the top there has a little pendulum and this shows repulsion um, it's, it's a very complicated tube, and there's a, there's a, a screen in there. You show the shadows, um, and you show repulsion, essentially, of cathode ray, ray tubes, as we would now expect. Um, the one at the bottom is a tube, again, that we don't know very much about, but I imagine it is the cathode is a spherical form to show the normal emission of rays from a cathode. Crookes was also interested in light bulbs and was one of the first people to have his home lit with them, and the filament in this light bulb is from his daughter's hair. And um, this is from the Notting Hill um, Lighting Company, which he was um, involved in for quite a long time. Periodic table. Um, I'm sorry I'm having to rush that. It's entirely my own fault. Um, Crookes had an idea about elements, which um, was shared by other people like Norman Lockyer, for example, in that they sort of a primordial soup and that they came together to coalesce. Actually... I don't know much about physics today, but I thought that maybe it was quite similar to some current ideas. I think he got the idea from mining um, of things coalescing and um, different elements being found close together in the earth. He made this beautiful periodic table in 1888. In fact, his assistant made it. And um, there are some white ones, as you can see, for um, elements not yet discovered. And I think radium is, is stuck in there as well. Um, stuck in there afterwards as an element that hadn't been discovered. Now, at the crossover points, you will get the, the zero valence of the inert atoms. It doesn't do everything, but it's a beautiful piece of equipment. Um, he returned to spectroscopy. Um, Norman Lockyer's spectroscope is on the left there, the seven prism one with which he discovered the element helium in the sun. This is Crookes, is the larger image, a five prism spectroscope with quartz um, prisms, um, with which he did a lot of work, unfortunately not terribly productive, on um, the rare earth metals. He had a project to get the spectra of every single um, substance on earth, and these are some of his spectra um, from the um, 1880s and 1890s, um, the ores. He turned in later life to X-rays and radioactivity and started to use his cathode rays tube for X-rays, um, that he used the lead objects, the same sort of thing that Röntgen had, had used, um, and those are his objects that he stuck in, in the way of X-rays. Um, typically of Crookes, he used different materials in this lovely lattice to show the varying um, sensitivities, the varying, what would you say, stoppability, if you like, of, of various metals. There he is um, in the well-known um, sort of cartoon character with a whacking great X-ray tube from about 1906, he took these X-ray images of these shells, which is particularly lovely. Uh, and just to show you 
down the left-hand side there is you don't just get the beautiful tube, you get all the gear that goes with it, and you probably remember the, um, his laboratory. Um, he was very interested in mining. He made money, but sometimes didn't. This is, relates to his Welsh mining activities on the, on the left, um, in which you call the first ingot. His own pitch blend sample, um, and then the autoradiograph, as he calls it, of that same pitch blend sample. He invented the spinsaroscope, um, a lovely little device, really, which uses zinc sulfide screen. Um, when the beta and the alpha radiation strike it, you can actually see the, um, the fluorescence. So you look sort of down a microscope. Sadly, it's radium on a pinhead. Um, we can't now use our spin thoroscopes, which, which is a real shame because they, they are quite radioactive. Glass and spectacles, at the end of his life, this was his last project. Many, many different colours of glass. Um, there was a government um, investigation into cataracts in workers in um, smelting and um, heat-relating heat um, activities. And Crooks came up with different types of glass to get rid of different areas of the spectrum. Um, mainly, the product was actually sunglasses um, of this rather lovely blue in the middle there. Instruments and toys and mascots. Um, most of this is about, has been about instruments as how we would see them scientifically, but often they come in under toys or just beautiful things like the flower tube on the right there or the Newton's ring, the Newton disc, which you can see at the back. And that's his coat of arms. I'm sorry, it's not a terribly good quality um, image, but you can see the prisms in there. You can see the radiometers. Um, I'm not quite sure if all that green is to do with thallium, but it well might be. And here there are two portraits of him. We're nearly at the end now. You can see that his periodic table was important to him and he liked to be with it um, about the 1890s, I think, on the left. And on the right, um, a, late, a later image of him, both with the radiometer again and the periodic table. Conclusions. Instruments have multiple roles. I think we can see that. Um, they do all these things, not just what you immediately think they're going to do. I think also we can notice the cross-fertilisation of ideas, the ideas with the technology. You get the optics, the heat, the electricity, um, the sort of things that you tend to read about in the standard um, history of science texts, but also matched by photography, spectroscopy, weighing, glass production, electricity supply and vacuum pumps. Crookes said, one good experiment is of more value than the ingenuity of a brain like Newton's. I don't think I would want to agree with that. Nevertheless, you can see that there's both, both play a part. Now, Crookes would say that because, really, it was the experiments that, where he excelled and he often needed help or he didn't make the grade quite because he didn't have the theory behind him. Um, the development of technology is essential to the history of scientific ideas and can be neglected. I'd like to end there. Thank you.